London. Rush hour. A train leaves Paddington Station. Another train approaches. The train was incredibly busy. heard anything like it, just a huge bang. You couldn't work out which train was which. When two commuter trains collide, investigators must discover what went wrong in the UK's worst rail disaster in a decade. Was it a terrible accident? Sabotage? Or even suicide? Disasters don't just happen, they're a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those final seconds from disaster. Dazed and in shock, Richard Carson is trapped inside a living nightmare. There were bits of rock and stone all around me. There was just an intense heat. I thought, we're all going to die. October 5th, 1999, 7.30 a.m. A regular commuter train. The same one Richard Castle catches to work every day. I was commuting to London from my home in Stroud in Gloucestershire. I did what us commuters all do. We get the newspaper out, drink the cup of tea, look at all the people getting on, getting off, not talking to any of them, of course. Jonathan Duckworth isn't usually on this train. That morning, I uh, caught an earlier train than normal because the previous time the train was late. It was one of those train journeys that, that you remember um, because the countryside looked, looked beautiful. In the diesel-powered high-speed trains control cab is driver Brian Cooper. He's worked on the railways for more than 30 years. He's carrying 421 passengers in eight carriages. They're cruising between Stroud and London, 140 kilometers away. London. Paddington Station. The morning rush hour is underway. Recently qualified driver Michael Hodder is preparing to take his three-carriage diesel Thames turbo train out of London to Bedwin in Wiltshire. He'll be carrying 147 passengers. The high-speed train makes its final stop on its journey to Paddington at Reading. 56 kilometers from London. Commuter Simon Benham just manages to make it on. The train was incredibly busy, no seats, so I stood up by the door, reading the morning paper, looking out the window. 8.06 a.m. At Paddington, the Thames Turbo receives the signal to depart. The next five minutes of its journey are the most challenging. His route involves crossing onto three different lines to get onto the right track. 
It's a busy time of day, with around 50 trains going in and out of the station every hour. Overseeing all this traffic are the signalers in the Slough new signal box. They can see both Brian Cooper's inbound high-speed train and Michael Hodder's Thames Turbo on its way out of Paddington. The high-speed train is just five minutes from Paddington, traveling at more than 120 kilometers per hour. I was uh, facing towards London. There was at least 10 other people stood around me and everyone was just had their own little space, listening to music, drinking coffee, reading the newspaper. 808. The outbound Thames turbo train is nearly two kilometers into its journey. It's already crossed one track and is about to cross onto another. The high-speed train is now just four kilometers from Paddington. Everybody stands up and they put their stuff away in their briefcases and they get their umbrellas out. And as is usual at that time, people used to walk up the train to, to the front. And I saw a man coming down and just for some reason our eyes met and we both smiled. Michael Hodder accelerates to 65 kilometers per hour. Hodder has passed a signal at red. The signalers aren't worried, it happens occasionally and the driver invariably stops. Hodder isn't slowing down. The Thames Turbo is about to cross into the path of the incoming high-speed train. speed of over 200 kilometers per hour. Train braked violently. I flew four foot forwards into the wall opposite, hit that face on and fell to the ground. I'd never heard anything like it, just a huge bang. And then the, uh, the carriage did what I'd call a pirouette. I couldn't tell what was happening at the time, but it clearly wasn't on the rails. Then, as the train was moving from left to right, and I was thinking, please, do not roll over. Because I knew if the train rolled over, my life would be in jeopardy. A vast fireball engulfs the carriages. The flames went, and then there was... A carriage and in the windows were people they looked like statues because they were pale and they were just staring back at me in the front carriage of the high-speed train Richard Castle finds himself surrounded by chaos The second ball of fire now sweeps through his carriage. Yeah, there was just an intense heat. I knew that the thing to do was to put the hands over my face to protect my eyes. Simon Benham's carriage is still upright. There was lots of dust, lots of smoke. People started to scream as well. That's one thing I do remember, that people were screaming. I looked out of the window and no more than four or five meters away was the engine on fire and I could feel the heat coming through the glass and burning my face. Simon manages to escape his carriage. Looking around, seeing the, the train off the tracks completely on its side, it sort of hit home then that this is you know, a major 
major disaster. I remember hearing someone screaming. I started to go towards the, the Thames train and there was a small explosion. And the, uh, the screaming stopped, unfortunately. Jonathan Duckworth's carriage is tipped on its side. We could hear people saying, we're, we're stuck, we're trapped in here. And Richard Castle is also still trapped inside the high-speed train. He's badly burnt and in terrible pain. The carriage was full of smoke, and I really couldn't see a thing. The other end of his carriage is alight, and the fire is spreading right towards him. The train doors won't open. It's a struggle to escape. The two men that were, were bashing through the door got through, and actually a bit of fresh air came through, a bit more light, and there was a cheer went up. And then gradually, uh, people started evacuating from the end of the carriage. I'd found uh, my bag and I'd found my jacket, and uh, ironically, they were important things when your life's been turned upside down. Across the road, staff in a superstore know that something dreadful has happened. One of my colleagues explained there'd been a train crash. They got ladders and they went down the embankment and they helped people up. We cleared the shop floor of bandages, everything. We turned the coffee shop into like a mini triage and we started to treat people. Simon Benham joins the fortunate but dazed survivors. As I was walking across the tracks, I looked up and saw 100, 200 people just stood there, looking very bewildered, very shocked, very emotional, very confused as well. It was just horrible. It was just chaos. I remember the smell of diesel and you know, sometimes if you're cooking and you singe your hairs on your... It was that, but ten times worse. Calls come in to the emergency services. <laughs> Our initial call to the actual incident was garages of light. But as soon as we pulled out the station, it became very obvious that we had uh, something a little bit more than garages of light. The vast scale of the accident is only apparent as Julian and his team get closer. We were met by about 300 survivors of various levels of distress. And for me specifically, it was about trying to bring some order to this, to what was chaos. Inside the high-speed train, fire is creeping towards Richard Castle, and he can't find a way out. Up above me, the other side of the train, there was a broken window. The smoke cleared for an instant, and the sunlight came through the window. And I was able just to climb out of that window by climbing up the, up the seats. Richard Castle is one of the lucky ones. The two trains are a tangled mess of metal and fire. And there are still people in the wreckage. But Julian Spooner's fire crew have only one fire hose. We had to make a decision to move that, that one hose round to protect the casualties that we knew were trapped and still alive at the time. We crossed over. Two trains, you couldn't work out which was which. 
Ingrid Allenlin and her colleagues do their best to help the injured. I remember one elderly gentleman, he had a head injury. And there was another gentleman, he must have been sitting behind the engine because he was completely drenched in diesel. And the thing that I remember the most are the mobile phones. The mobile phones that were still going off. Other emergency crews begin to arrive on the scene. I remember thinking with some relief that they'd arrived because the, the nature of the injuries and the way that the train is sort of compacted meant that we were there for five hours trying to cut these people out. 400 kilometres away, Detective Superintendent Nick Bracken is notified about the accident. I received a phone call that the Chief Constable um, had appointed me to be the senior investigating officer in charge of the investigation. Bracken arrives at the crash site four hours after the impact. 31 people are dead. And more than 400 injured. Finding the cause of the crash will be one of the biggest challenges of Nick Bracken's career. Now, by rewinding the events of that day and going deep into the investigation, we can reveal what really happened. Quite clearly, in any of disaster of this kind, it becomes a very big jigsaw because we've got to put it back together. You will only do that by getting all the pieces. Bracken knows there are many possible explanations. The reality is, at an early stage, you will look at every single possibility, you know, from direct criminal action down to negligence all the way through. Uh, you know, someone could have been on the trackside and committed acts of sabotage. Uh, anything, you know, is possible at this stage. Witness statements reveal something very unusual about the crash. There were two huge fireballs. One that engulfed the trains on impact. And a second fireball that tore through Richard Castle's carriage of the high-speed train moments later. In train crashes, um, to have a crash and a fire was unusual. I'd certainly never heard of that scenario. Uh, and it was quite clearly uh, something that had to be investigated. Were the fireballs a result of the crash? Or had they caused it? Detectives scour the area around the accident scene for clues and witnesses. They find a security camera in the Superstore parking lot that is facing the rail tracks. What they see is significant. The camera is pointing at the exact spot where the trains collide. We knew that the fire had been instantaneous, and we got that from the security video, and we had to find out how this happened. Nick Bracken brings in specialist help to shed light on the cause of the first fireball. Amongst the country's leaders in accident research are the health and safety executive. Assigned to the crash is fire investigator Phil Hayes. There are fires occasionally on the railways. In this case, the fire was far more extensive than uh, people had experienced before. It's crucial to determine what could have caused such an inferno. The investigation had to look uh, for a number of things. They had to look for the source of ignition, and then they had to look at how the fire had propagated through the vehicles. Examining the CCTV footage of the first fireball, the investigators find vital clues. They estimate that it's at least 22 meters high and extends many meters along the length of the carriages. Between them, the two trains are carrying nearly 5,000 liters of diesel in several large tanks. 
But unlike gasoline, liquid diesel is very hard to ignite. So Phil and his team need to understand if the dynamics of the collision could have created the conditions for a fireball. The turbo train was an aluminium bodied train. Its total weight was probably just in excess of 100 tonnes. The high speed train was a much, much heavier train, possibly of the order of 400 tonnes. When the two hit, the lighter Thames turbo sustains most of the damage. Its foremost carriage is pulverized and the roof sheared off. The fuel tank on the leading power car of the turbo failed due to the front of that vehicle being driven backwards right at the very start of the crash. But understanding the source of the diesel during the impact still doesn't explain the fireball. Phil knows that liquid diesel is difficult to ignite. But diesel in the form of a vapor is a different story. To see if the impact was powerful enough to vaporize the diesel, Phil's team recreated the crash using a tank containing colored water. Which was instantly vaporized. As the front of the power car was driven backwards, it would have impacted the fuel tank. The fuel tank would have been compressed and the fuel would have been released under pressure. And that's what we think produced the diesel cloud. To ignite the diesel cloud, you need a spark. Electric trains powered by overhead cables also use these tracks. The 25 kilovolt overhead line was damaged during the crash. And therefore, there would have been discharges from the overhead electrics. So Phil and his team filled the test tank with diesel and added overhead sparks to simulate damaged electrical cables above the crash. We had approximately 300 litres of diesel in the test tank. The tank ruptured under pressure as predicted and the fuel ignited producing a fireball of about nine metres radius. But a mystery remains. Survivors described a second fireball. Phil and his team have to go back to a map of the wreckage that they plotted when they first got to the accident scene. We spent almost a week on site, tracking down each piece of debris, photographing it, locating it on a map, so that we could produce a sort of debris pattern. The high-speed train's fuel tank was found many metres away from the power car. What we believe happened is that tank became free from its mountings. It was also partly ruptured in the impact and was propelled down the track. And as it did so, it dispersed the fuel within it. But if this rogue fuel tank was careering down the track, how did it cause a fireball inside the carriage? By this time, the, the windows had been broken in the impact and much of the fuel that was dispersed from that leading HST tank entered. So that was the source of the fuel for the fireball. This freak and fatal combination of events creates the worst fire ever seen in a train crash. It's clear that the fire was a direct result of the crash, not the cause of it. And that cause remains a mystery.
Investigator Nick Bracken knows that it was the Thames Turbo that had crossed into the path of the high-speed train. So it's the Thames Turbo that he focuses his investigation on. It had gone through a red light moments before impact. An obvious suspect is a mechanical malfunction on the train. The Thames Turbo is fitted with an automatic warning system, which is designed to prevent a driver from passing a signal at red. When approaching a red signal, a display flashes and a horn sounds. If the driver doesn't acknowledge this warning by pressing a button, the system automatically engages the train's brakes. To determine whether or not Hodder received a warning, Nick Bracken knows he must obtain a vital piece of equipment lying in the wreckage. It was quite crucial to try and find the black box data recorder, similar to, to that found in aircrafts. What was the data recorder going to tell us about the, the journey of the Thames train? The recovery of that data recorder and getting that interpreted was actually going to be quite crucial. The black box data recorder logs all the warnings given by the automatic warning system and the responses of the driver. It's found in the wreckage, but is badly damaged. I made the decision that we would be best trying to recover that data by getting the manufacturers to interpret the data for us. The data recorder is rushed to Italy for analysis which will take time. Nick Bracken turns his attention to the brakes on the Thames Turbo. Naturally, the worthiness of the vehicle, the train, was it operating correctly? Was there brake failure had to be examined? His team recover the mangled brake system from the scene. The team that did the reconstruction comes to the conclusion that it had been maintained properly and was working properly. There was no mechanical failure. They find Michael Hodder had engaged the brakes and they had worked, but it was too late. He must have applied them only at the last moment when he saw the oncoming high-speed train. When the black box results come back from Italy, Nick Bracken is relieved to discover that the manufacturers have managed to extract the important information from the shattered remains. It reveals that Hodder's automatic warning system was working perfectly and confirms that he had braked. It showed that the driver had passed through a number of signals, that the warning equipment had sounded and the driver's actions had been appropriate. There had been no malfunction. But the data highlights something else. The automatic warning system has an inherent design flaw. The warning system did not distinguish between a red signal and an amber signal. The automatic warning system only prompts the driver to look for a signal. It's up to the driver to check whether it's amber, which means he can proceed, or red, at which he must stop. The data recorder's results show there is nothing unusual about Michael Hodder's journey until he reaches signal SN109. On approach to the signal, the warning sound goes off and he acknowledges and accepts that um, and then proceeds through the signal. But SN109 was at red. 
He should have seen this signal and stopped his train before passing it. Now the data recorder reveals a final shocking bombshell. Not only did driver Michael Hodder pass the red signal, he accelerated through it. Straight into the path of the high-speed train and certain death. Quite clearly something had gone wrong. Whether it was an intentional act or whether it was accidental, it was my duty to find out. Had the driver accidentally passed this signal at danger? Had he deliberately passed it? Has the driver committed suicide and murdered 30 people? Bracken needs to determine if there's any truth to rumours that Michael Hodder had committed suicide. I have found nothing to suggest the driver of the Thames train was anything other than uh, a dedicated and competent train driver whose family life and circumstances were very content, very stable. All the evidence suggests that Michael Hodder didn't intentionally cause the crash. Bracken focuses his investigation on the signal Hodder passed. SN 109. Finding out why Hodder drove through the red light is the job of health and safety investigator Steve Walker. That's a difficult investigation because you're looking at the visual aspects of almost the, the human aspects of, of how the driver was able to see that light and how the driver was able to, to respond. Steve Walker examines the signal in more detail. Conventional railway signals consist of a vertical line of four lights. But signal SN109 is different. The signal was in a shape of a reverse L with red light on the end of the L, which is very strange. You know, it's a non-standard configuration of the signaling on the UK railway network. Signals direct the hundreds of trains on the network to keep them moving safely. It's vital that the drivers understand what's required of them as soon as they see the signal. The problem with the reverse L signal was that at times you didn't see the whole of the signal in your line of sight. You may only see one or two of the lights. And Steve Walker also studies the route that Michael Hodder took. Coming out of Paddington Station, there's about nine lines. There's a lot of road bridges, there's a lot of railway gantries, there's overhead lines, so actually it's pretty cluttered in the areas where the signals were. The position of SN109, soon after a bridge and on a crowded overhead gantry, combined with its non-standard shape, makes it a difficult signal for a driver to see clearly. We've concluded that signal SN109 presented a very difficult signal sighting challenge for the driver. But Hodder didn't realize he had made a mistake. Instead, it's likely he thought the signal was amber, meaning safe to proceed, and so accelerated through it. It still doesn't answer how Hodder could think a red signal was amber. There is a phenomenon known among drivers as a phantom signal. There's always a potential for the sun sort of glinting onto the front of the lights in the signals and masking them or creating a phantom signal. Steve Walker decides to send a test train along the route. At exactly the same time of day as the Thames Turbo passed signal SN109, and he finds that there is sunlight reflecting off the signal lens. So it made it a little bit sort of weaker than you'd expect. The day of the crash was a perfect autumn morning. The sun was low in the sky behind the Thames turbo. It was shining onto the signal, 
which was partially obscured by the road bridge and cables. The evidence suggests that Hodder thought it was amber rather than red. Amber would have meant he was clear to go on, which is why he accelerated through it. It seems to be the breakthrough the team have worked so hard to reach. Signal SN109 is the cause of the crash. But the investigation isn't over. We had three crucial crime scenes. The scene itself where the crash has taken place. The signals that have been passed. But also the signal box at Slough. Bracken's team home in on the signal box and discover that the collision might yet have been prevented. In an emergency, the signalers can send a stop message directly to a driver and have the power to change signals. But the investigators make a disturbing discovery. There had been a fatal delay. If a number of seconds were not lost before any action had been taken, there is a chance that the train may have been able to be stopped. The signalers at Slough New Signal Box can prevent disaster by sending a stop message to the Thames turbo driver Michael Hodder. But the signalers lack experience in using this technology. There was certainly some delay. It wasn't instantly that any action was taken. Nick's team is unable to ascertain which of the signalmen sent Michael Hodder a stop message. At that point, I tried to The signalers claim that it was transmitted, but there is no hard evidence to prove whether Hodder ever received it. What is known? is that the Thames turbo train doesn't stop. The signalers had another option that could save lives. There's a signal in front of the high-speed train, SN120. If they switch this signal to red, the high-speed train could slow down before impact. But with the high-speed train racing towards the signal at 127 kilometers per hour, they have just seconds to act if they are to save lives. Instead, 18 seconds pass before the signalers change the signal to red. It's too late. The opportunity of diverting the signal to red for the train coming into Paddington had been lost. If split-second instant action had been taken, rather than allowing 15, 20 seconds to elapse, that train would have started to break, and obviously travelling at a lower speed. And the lower the speed of impact, the less serious the consequences. The last chances are lost. Vital seconds go by before they send a stop message to Thames turbo driver Michael Hodder. And they turn signal SN120 red too late to stop the high-speed train. Disaster is now inevitable. And now we can rewind the events of that morning to show what led to one of the worst rail disasters in British history. October the 5th, 1999. Nine minutes from disaster. A high-speed train carrying 422 people travels at 127 kilometers per hour from the west of England towards London's Paddington Station. Three minutes from disaster. Thames turbo train departs the platform at Paddington. 
45 seconds from disaster. Thames turbo driver Michael Hodder is alerted by his automatic warning system of an approaching signal, SN109. He knows from the horn that the signal could either be amber or red. He acknowledges it by pressing the button. 35 seconds from disaster. The signal is obscured and the low morning sun is probably reflecting off it. Hodder must not have seen that it's red for danger. But instead, thinks that it's amber and accelerates past it. The signalers wait to see if Michael Hodder will realize his mistake and brake. The signalers send a message to the Thames Turbo telling Michael Hodder to stop. But it's not known if he ever receives this message. The Thames Turbo train is now on a collision course with the high speed train. 10 seconds from disaster. The signalers turn another signal red in a desperate bid to slow the high speed train. But there's no time for it to stop. Three seconds from disaster. Driver Michael Hodder sees the approaching high-speed train and engages his brakes, but it's too late. The faster high-speed train forces the front of the Thames turbo backwards, crushing its fuel tank. This vaporizes the diesel inside and creates a huge cloud of fuel. The cloud is probably ignited by a spark from damaged overhead cables, creating a gigantic fireball. As carriages derail, a fuel tank breaks free from the high-speed train, flies down the track and fires a second cloud of burning diesel through a broken window in the front carriage. There, of course, was a public inquiry and there was a prosecution by the health and safety executive. Network Rail, the operator of signal SN109, was fined £4 million for negligence that led to the disaster. And Thames Trains were fined £2 million for failing to provide Thames turbo driver Michael Hodder with the correct training regarding the problematic SN109. No fault was found with Michael Hodder. My own belief is he genuinely made an error and because of the same sounding that you get for an amber signal as you get for a red signal, he genuinely made a mistake. There was a low sun on that October morning. I am firmly of the belief that that driver went through that signal in the belief it was amber. Network Rail did eventually change signal SN109 and it's now far easier for drivers to see. And the Paddington Rail disaster leaves another legacy, which means today this accident couldn't happen. Trains on this route are now fitted with an automatic stopping system that should take driver error out of the equation. Now, if a driver passes a red light, the train automatically stops, whether he acknowledges the warning signal or not. But the morning commute that turned into tragedy continues to live with those who were there on that fateful day. You have these feelings of enormous guilt, you know. You want to apologize for, for surviving. Why is it me that walked away and not dying? The man that I smiled at as, as he was walking down to the front of the coach, he, he died. So very, very sad. People ask me about this sort of the sunlight coming through the window and was there a spiritual dimension to it? I can't answer that one. Uh, but I do know that if it, that sunlight hadn't come through the smoke, I don't think I would have ever got out of the carriage.